Hey everybody, welcome back to Mythgard Academy's class on the Mortar Thor. I feel like I've been gone longer than I have. In fact, we just had class last week, but uh, it's been a long week with lots going on, an enormous amount of fun in it, uh, because I went to the Bay Area for Baymoot this past weekend, which was awesome. Uh, I was uh, over in Oakland. I saw I see a couple of you here uh, that I got to meet when I was out there, which was fantastic. Uh, such a great time. Wonderful presentations. Great people. Wonderful day. Uh, it was awesome. And as a bonus, I got to drive down on Friday to San Jose and hang out with a bunch of folks who were down there for Worldcon. So kind of doubled up there a little bit. And that was really, that was really neat, too. So... Uh, anyway, so that's um, that's the that was uh, it's, as I say, a lot has been uh, has been going on on the subject of a lot going on and also of of uh, regional moots. Uh, we are coming into regional moot season. It's very exciting. We have four more regional events coming up uh, soon now on the schedule between now and January. So uh, pay attention to moots near you that are coming up. So first we have one in the middle of America in Kansas City, Missouri. That is going to be on October 6th. Uh, and uh, that's going to be... Uh, uh, the, uh, so I'm, I'm looking forward to going. I've never been to Kansas City before. So uh, that's going to be great. It's Columbus Day weekend. So uh, we're going to be out there. Uh, the registration is open for that. Where's my... Let me, let's see. If you go to the Signum University page... There we are, and you scroll down, and here are the events, so you can click on the Middle Moot page and uh, get on the registration there. We also have on the 27th, LA Moot coming up. Um, so that's October 20, Saturday, October 27th in LA, uh, and those are going to be... Uh, uh, so those are both going to be great. I've never, uh, well, I have been to, I've been to LA before, but actually very rarely, only twice in my life. Um, and, uh, never for like a good reason. So <laughs> I mean, okay. I guess my sister-in-law's wedding is a good reason, but it was a long time ago and I was barely there. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, not to mention I was super distracted because my wife was like eight months pregnant with our first child at the time. So anyway, um, Excited to be going out to L.A. and getting to connect with folks out there, too. Then in November, on November 10th, uh, we don't have the uh, registration link uh, quite up for this one yet. It's a little bit further down the road. Um, is Magnolia Moot uh, down in the southeast in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, and then in January, January 19th, we are having Tex Moot again, our second annual Tex Moot. Uh, and that's going to be in Waco, Texas this year. So for Moots coming up, two in October, one in November, one in January, and then we'll have some more uh, next year, uh, next spring as we go. So um, anyway, uh, really, really, um, really, really fun uh, stuff coming up. I hope you'll be able to, again, the goal of this is, you know, if there's, if, if you can get there, you know, we, we, we're, we're trying to come, we can't you know, come to everybody's hometown, of course, but we're trying to get somewhere close to you such that, you know, you could maybe drive in for a day trip and uh, have a really fun day with us. Um, you know, the conference itself is very, they are all very low cost. You know, they're all like 40, 45 bucks at most for the day. Uh, and that includes lunch. And, uh, uh, you know, so it's, uh, it's, it's an inexpensive, really fun day, which we hope lots of people will be able to uh, get to. And we're, as I say, we're kind of moving, moving out uh, uh, and uh, moving around the hope, the uh, tentative plans right now. We don't have dates and schedules for these yet. Tentative plans for the spring are going to be uh, Seattle, New York City, and oh yeah, back to Europe. Uh, we haven't decided exactly where in Europe yet, so... Yeah. Anyhow, uh, really, really great stuff. Also, you may notice as I was on this page, I was uh, uh, scrolling past uh, this link here in the middle. Uh, it was uh, uh, H.P. Lovecraft's birthday on Monday. In celebration of his birthday, Signum is offering a special on our Anytime Audit on that class. And I don't know how many of you know about our Anytime Audit program, but it's kind of awesome. Um, we have offered a lot of really cool courses uh, over the years uh, that Signum has been operating, uh, uh, taught by some of the uh, best scholars uh, in the world and, and also some by me. But <clears throat> this 
one is uh, the, the, the only class we've ever taught. It's a, it's a full class, a full semester course on H.P. Lovecraft taught by Dr. Amy Sturgis, who is an absolutely wonderful lecturer um, and just knows like everything about everything. So uh, our Lovecraft class was absolutely cool. Uh, and the our Anytime Audit program, as I say, is pretty nifty. Um, any course that we've ever offered before, uh, almost everyone, eh, very close to all of them, um, you can go uh, in our course catalog there and you can get access to, you know, like you're auditing the class, but, you know, after the fact. So you get access to all the recorded lectures in audio and video form, as well as all the, you know, the class readings and reading assignments and handouts and things. Uh, so again, it's like you're able to sort of sit in on the class, um, you know, retroactively, essentially. Uh, it's pretty cool. Normally, um, our anytime audits uh, are ninety-five dollars, so, so it's it's like uh, you know, it's you think about it like you know one of those uh, you know great courses or something like that, except cooler. Um, Anyway, so normally it's $95 is the tuition for an anytime audit. Uh, but uh, again, in honor of HP Lovecraft's birthday, we have the Lovecraft class uh, for $75 here for the next uh, two. Well, we're halfway through the first week here. Um, but anyway, so strongly recommend uh, 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 the uh, Lovecraft class if you get a chance. And in addition... Um, of course, I should mention our semester starts next term. If you're interested in taking a course a little bit more contemporaneously, uh, we have our live classes. There's still time to get involved. If you've been uh, toying with the idea of joining our program or perhaps uh, starting one of our certificate programs, uh, that we uh, there's time yet. Uh, although the semester, the classes begin on Monday, uh, we will. Uh, there's still time. So, um, yeah. Uh, Takako, you're taking science fiction too? That's cool. That's a really good class. Of course, that's uh, also uh, Amy Sturgis there. Um, yeah. Oh, and uh, Doc, I did. Uh, I did get your email. Thank you. I'm, I've been behind on my email ever since uh, vacation, and I'm dashing around doing 100 things this week. But I did get it, and I am totally writing you back very soon. Thank you. All right. Well, let us get back to Maori here. We have... Uh, uh, we have some Balin to finish up. I'm hoping uh, to finish this first section of the Mort d'Arthur only one class behind. I had planned it out for six, and I think we might get there in seven. We're, 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 we're doing a little bit better now. We're going to finish Balin today and look at the wedding of uh, King Arthur and Guinevere. Uh, and the events that happen around that. Uh, so we'll see if we get so far as uh, the bizarre quest of the heart, the bratchet, uh, and the knight and lady. Um, so, uh, yeah, cool. Oh, Dolorous Stroke. So, um, um, the, uh, the Bodleian, um, exhibit, that's traveling to New York, uh, and that's, like, why, actually, we're looking at the, at New York City. Uh, we're wanting to do a New York City moot, um, which will involve the Morgan Library, where the Tolkien exhibit is coming to America, so that we can look at the Tolkien exhibit and also, and then have some sort of panels and discussions and things. So, yeah. All right. Um, cool. All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, oh, good. Yeah, Stephen Covers talking about what a great lecturer Amy Sturgis is. She really is. Um, again, she just knows everything, and she is just like a ball of energy. She's fantastic. Uh, really, really love all this. She uh, has not been able to teach with us recently, but I, I just I love all of the courses that she has taught with us. We have we are very blessed to have had uh, Dr. Sturgis teaching with us. Um, okay, tonight the dolorous stroke and the momentous marriage. Let's get to it. Okay, so when last we left the unfortunate Sir Balin, he was getting followed around by an invisible guy who keeps stabbing everybody he walks around with, right? So remember that uh, Sir Garlon, um, who rides around invisibly, uh, uh, keeps riding around invisibly and stabbing people at unawares, but never Sir Balin himself, right? Remember Sir Balin promised to, uh, to bring the guy back to King Arthur under safe conduct? in order for the guy to tell him why he was sad, uh, which he really, really didn't want to tell King Arthur for some reason. Uh, and we never even learned the story behind that, right? And that guy was stabbed. And remember, he had a damsel. There was a, a lady that he was with who was very broken up 
by his death. Not too broken up on the ladies broken up by the death of Nightscale, right? I mean, we've seen a number of ladies um, who summarily commit suicide upon the death of uh, the knights with whom they're traveling. Uh, So this was not quite that extreme, but sufficiently extreme that she carries around the truncheon of the spear, so like the, the broken off end of the spear, that killed this knight. She carries it around with her at all times. She's like 24 seven walking around with this broken truncheon of spear. And, uh, but she's going around with Sir Bowen. So like, you know, Sir Bowen, uh, inherits her. Right. Uh, and we just saw at the end of last time, uh, this other knight, this other random knight who like meets Sir Balin and travels with him for like a couple hours. Right. And as soon as he does, uh, Sir Garland just rides by again, stabs him. Uh, and, uh, and then they bury him. And then of course they wake up in the morning to find that Merlin has graffitied the tomb, uh, with prophetic gold letters. So, um, that's, um, that's where we've been. Right. Um, and, uh, and yeah, Arthur, we've got the business about that. We, he, he, ran into this guy who was upset because Sir Gollum killed his son, right? Or no, injured his son. But his son can't be healed of his injuries without a, uh, a bowl of the blood of the knight who injured him, right? Just like, you know, uh, respect the treatment regimen, folks. Don't question that. Um, so, um, yeah, anyhow, so uh, that's that's where he was. So he has gone to the, a feast at King Pelham's and King Pelham had this rule that said that only knights with ladies could come in, right? You have to have a plus one in order to get into this party. So, uh, he did because he had a damsel, but his host, the father of the young wounded knight, uh, who needs, uh, Sir Garland's blood, uh, wasn't allowed to come in. Um, now, Sir Balin finds himself in a fix, right? Uh, because when he gets into the feast, he discovers that Sir Garlon, the invisible knight, is there, perfectly visible, which is the good news. But the bad news is that he's apparently the brother of King Pelham, who is hosting the feast, right? Um, so there is, you know, his uh, his enemy, the despicable Sir Garlon, who keeps murdering people, not just, you know, he's not just killing folks. Killing folks happens, right? I mean, like, it can happen to anybody. Uh, but murdering folks is riding up invisible, which mind, we've had not the faintest explanation of, right? No one has even gestured towards any kind of mechanism for the invisibility of Sir Garland, right? Um, uh, we don't know how he does it, but he does do it, and what he does with it is particularly bad, right? So, uh, um, he certainly, he has the power to turn himself invisible, but certainly puts that invisibility to crooked and malicious uses, as somebody once said. Um, so, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Arthur wants to know what's the opposite of bloodletting. Is, is it blood pudding? What do they, what, what do they call it? Yeah. Something like that. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, Karita, I agree. This is a real social quandary, right, that uh, Sir Balin finds himself in. So, okay, so here's here's his whole line of thinking. I love it when we are, we don't always get this, right, but I love it when we get the, like, internal monologue of one of uh, Maori's knights, I think, trying to decide what to do, right? Then Balin advised him long and thought, if I slay him here, I shall not escape. And if I leave him now, peradventure I shall never meet with him again at such a staven, and much harm he will do, and he live. And therewith this garland aspired that Balin visaged him, and so he come and slapped him on the face with the back of his hand, and said, Knicht, we beholdest thou me so, for Shama, eat thy meat, and do that thou come for. Thou sayest so, said Balin, this is not the first spite that thou hast done me. Therefore, I will do. Therefore, I will do that I come for, and rolls him up fiercely and clove his head to the shoulders. No, give me the truncheon," said Balin to his laddie, "that he slew that he slew your knight with." And anon she gaffed him, for always she had the she and the trun she. Uh, sorry, I think I had, I had a typo there. For always she had the truncheon with her. 
and therewith Balin smote him and threw the body and said openly, With that truncheon thou slowest a god knicked, and no it sticketh in thy body. Then Balin called unto his host and said, No may ye fetch bloody nook to heal your son withal. This is wonderful. Now, Mallory appears to have forgotten that the host couldn't come to the party because he didn't have a lady, right? His uh, his host got turned back at the door. Uh, but, you know, it's uh, it's fine. Um, we're, we're, you know, uh, continuity. It's fine. Um, <laughs> Dora Stroke says, Dear Abby, I want to kill this guy, but is it rude to do this at a party? Um, yeah, exactly. Okay. So, uh, yeah, Jennifer, that's a strange word, and I don't understand it. Staven. Um, uh, Staven, it, 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 it means, uh, like, uh, occasion, right? I, I, I might, what he means when he says, I shall never meet with him again at such a Staven, he's saying, I might not ever have an opportunity like this again. I mean, keep in mind, this is literally the first time he's ever seen him. Right? This is the first time he's 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 not only been in the room with the opportunity to fight him, but but that, that where Garland has not been invisible in murdering folks, right? So it's it is a pretty good opportunity that 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 Balin has here. Um and uh okay, okay, so now but he's kind of he's still torn, right? Now notice what he's torn about. He doesn't seem to be thinking too much about the social niceties of the situation. He has a rather pragmatic view of this whole situation. If I slay him here, I shall not escape. Right. I'm almost certainly going to die uh, if I rise up in the middle of the feast and kill the brother of my host. Probably there are going to be a number of people present who are going to take exception to that kind of action. So probably um, uh, things are going to get ugly after that. However... Garland essentially comes and takes the the decision out of his hands, practically, right? I mean, if if Balin was waiting for a sign to tell him what was the, you know, to suggest what was the right thing to do, you know, he's like, should I fight Garland or should I not fight Garland? Garland comes over and smacks him in the face, right? Um, which is practically a challenge, not quite a challenge, right? But it's practically a challenge. Um, and then not only that, he says these portentous words. He didn't mean that. He didn't know what he was saying. Garland didn't know what he was saying when he said, um, eat thy meat and do that thou come for. Uh, by which I assume he meant like, you know, like be at the party, right? Um, but of course, unbeknownst to him, what Balin came for was to kill Garland. So here Garland out of his own mouth says, uh, you should go ahead and do that thing, do what you came here to do. And so Balin's like, all right, I shall, you know, he doesn't actually quote Aragorn and say, I shall take this message as a sign. But you know, he's like, all right, you said it, I'm doing it. And he pulls out his sword and cuts his head in half. Um, and, and the thing is, you look at how this little incident right here, I mean, it gets ugly after this, but um, as he predicted, though even more than he predicted, really. Um, so he, um, th briefly, this looks like a, a happy ending, a, a, a weird kind of happy ending, right? But because remember, Balin is not just being bloodthirsty here, right? Sir Garland was a legitimately horror. I mean, he was a murderer. He's a, he was he he was a traitor knight. He was a recreant knight. He was a, he was a murderer, right? Um, so he deserved killing by the morality of the book. That's not really a problem. Um, and what's more, that notice the emphasis on the the sort of righting of wrongs, right? He has been Balin has been person not only personally affronted, of course, by Garland, but even more importantly, Sir Garland has been leaving victims all around, several of which Balin has brought with him, right? Including the lady who is still mourning the death of that first night that Sir Garland killed, uh, and uh, and and the host whose son is still dying for lack of Sir Garland's blood because science. So, um, and he look at and he's he's able to fix it all, right? This is this is Balin. 
living the dream, right? This is this is the this is the best possible outcome to this. He's just killed Garland, and then he says, "Hey, lady, I do you still have the spear?" She brings it with her to the party, like you do, right? The bloodstained truncheon that she pulled out of the body of her uh, uh, dead knight from before. So he takes the bloodstained truncheon and stabs it into the corpse of Sir Garland and gives a little speech, right? Uh, uh, with that truncheon thou slewest a good knecht, and no, it sticketh in thy body. Uh, Garland presumably not really paying attention uh, uh, much to the speech at the time, given that his head has been bisected. But uh, it's this is um, this is still a kind of an important point. I mean, if that seems overkill or strange, well, I mean, it is. But the point is, um, the point is that. Uh, he is making a point here, but it's a relevant point, right? Um, he's not just, he, Balin, is not just like some guy who comes up and kills people at parties routinely, right? This is not his normal approach. Um, Sir Garland deserved it. Uh, and the truncheon is a mark of that, right? And that's why he makes his speech. With that truncheon, thou slowest a good knecht, and now it sticketh in thy body. Uh, so this is, uh, you know, so he stabs him and says, this is the... Uh, um, uh, this is the, uh, you know, this is the chickens coming home to roost, right, on a murderer. Um, and then, you know, then he turns to his host who, uh, you know, has apparently apparated into the room and says, uh, now may ye fetch blood enough to heal your son withal, pointing to the benevolent outcome. Right. Again, this is wrongs being actively righted. Uh, uh, yes, a, a dude has just been killed bloodily in the hall, uh, but that's a again, good has been done here. Right. So briefly, this sounds like, you know, Balin is uh, has really achieved uh, something. Uh, Rachel, yeah, trying to make sure everyone knows the difference between his behavior and Garland. Yeah, though, Rachel, I don't get the impression that the target of that speech are really the bystanders in the room. I mean, in, to a sense, in, in, in a sense, they are, as of course, presumably it's not actually the corpse of Garland that he is attempting to inform about the situation. Um, but I don't feel like he's trying to justify himself. I mean, in the sense that I don't think Balin is defensive about what he's done. Um uh, he knows that he's done right, and he's do. It. I think it's it's it, mostly for the lady's sake. Uh, honestly, I think the lady is the primary intended audience of that little speech, right? To sort of show, see, I promised that I would set this right, and I have set it right, right? Got, you know, the 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 murderer of your knight is dead, um, and I have you know reversed things on him and stabbed him through with the truncheon. Uh, so there we go. Um, and now, and again, now, and now we're healing your son. So he's dispensed judge uh, justice. He's he's you know distributing healing blood. Uh, this is uh, this is great, right? This is excellent. Briefly, then it gets ugly, but it doesn't get ugly in exactly the way that he was kind of thinking, right? He was expecting to be slain, but I think he was expecting to get mobbed, right? Instead, he just gets attacked by King Pelham himself. Um, which doesn't really go well. And indeed, we get the dolorous stroke. So, uh, remember, you will recall, of course, that Merlin prophesied that because he let the lady die, remember when that lady came and he didn't succeed in taking the night sword away from her and she stabbed herself, right? She ran herself through. Uh, and Merwin's like, oh man, if you had prevented her dying, that you know, since you didn't prevent her die, then now now you're going to strike the dolorous, you know, the most dolorous stroke ever uh, uh, by anybody. Carita wants to know exactly how much blood is in fact needed uh, to fix his illness. <laughs> like, I don't know, uh, but however much he needs, he can get right. He can get bloody nuch, right? Uh, you know, it's it, it can be a nuch uh, because. Uh, there's plenty to spare, right? In fact, probably all over the, the, the appetizer course, honestly. Um, so, yeah, so he um, he's going to strike the dolorous stroke. Oh, uh, Lynn, yeah, there is a difference between a lady and a damsel. Damsel literally means virgin. So a damsel is an unmarried lady. Um, uh, a married, I mean, a married lady who is not a virgin, uh 
is, can still you, you can still be a lady, right? A damsel can still be a lady, but not all ladies are damsels. Um, so at, normally when it's a damsel, you're you're supposed to picture someone young, sometimes quite young. Right? I mean, there 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 will be occasional damsels in this in, uh, in this book who appear to be of an elementary school age, <laughs> conceivably, uh, but. Um, uh, but m- m- few of them are mostly they're uh, 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 sort of, you know, <laughs> all between the ages of 16 and 19 and a half or something like that. Uh, but anyway, they're they're uh, damsel specifically means uh, means virgin, i.e. unmarried lady. Um, like maid, Veronica. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Um, OK, good. So, right. Dolor stroke. And at the time, it was a little bit unclear, right? He's going to strike the most dolorous stroke that was ever struck and, and, and like horrible things are going to happen because of it. And it was a little unclear exactly what that meant, right? So we have finally gotten to the dolorous stroke. Fan King Pelham caught in his hand a grim weapon and smote eagerly at Balin. But he put his sword betwixt his head and the stroke and therewith his sword brast in sunder. And when Balin was weaponless, he ran into a chamber for to seek a weapon, and fro chamber to chamber, and no weapon could he find. And all-wise King Pelham followed after him, and at the last he entered into a chamber, which was marvelously dicht and rich, and a bed arrayed with a cloth of gold, the richest that meeked bay, and on lying therein. And thereby stood a table of clean gold, with four pillars of silver that bar up the table, and upon the table stood a marvellous spear, strangely rocked. So, when Balan saw the spear, he got it, got it in his hand, and turned to King Pelham, and felled him, and smote him passingly sore with that spear, that King Pelham fell doon in a swoog. And therewith the castle brack, roof, and wallace, and fell doon to the earth. And Balin fell down, and meek not steer hand nor foot, and for the most party of that castle was dead through the dolorous stroke. Okay, so what just happened here? Okay, a uh, couple of vocabulary terms here. Uh, dicht. Dicht means uh, uh, sort of dressed or accoutred. So uh, the chamber is marvelously dicht. Uh, so it's marvelously decorated and uh, uh, apportioned. Uh, it's, a, it's a very fancy chamber. Um, yeah, and and sw- and a such is a is a swoon. He uh, he 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 falls down. He passes out. Um, uh, because he was smote passingly sore. He gets stabbed with the spear. Um, yeah, decked, basically. Yeah, exactly. Dight. Uh, uh, it's, it, uh, yeah, uh, if, you, if you deck the halls with boughs of holly, it might be considered marvelously decked thereafter. Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, that's it. Okay, so... Yeah, as Corita points out, the misuse of holy objects is never going to end well. Yeah, so let's... Now, Rachel, yeah, I agree. We need to kind of back up a second here. Um, So, like, what the heck just happened, right? Um, He fells King Pelham in self-defense, right? He is fleeing for his... King Pelham is after him uh, with some grim weapon, right? Probably an axe or something like that. So here's King, at least that's what I always imagine, King Pelham with a battle axe chasing after him. Um, so there's this dude with a battle axe. His sword is already broken. This is kind of ironic, right? Sir Bowen is the knight with two swords and he's like now down to one sword and he doesn't even have that one with him. So uh, here's the knight with two swords with zero swords uh, running through the castle trying to find somewhere a weapon. Uh, you know, like where do they where's the room where they have like swords and battle axes hanging on the walls above the fireplace, right? He can't find the right room. Um, so absolutely self-defense, right? Absolutely self-defense. He's he's, he's going to be chopped to mincemeat by King Pelham. Uh, and then he knocks him and then wham, all of a sudden, like the entire castle explodes, right? He, he, when King Pelham falls, the castle, the roof and walls, break uh 
and uh, they fall to the earth, right? The whole castle collapses when he stabs uh, King Pelham, and almost everyone in the castle is killed. Uh, Balin, not killed. He does fall down and might not stir hand nor foot. Um, I'm uh, suspecting, by the way, that he couldn't stir hand nor foot, not because he was, like, paralyzed or something, but because he's buried under rubble from the collapsing castle, I suspect, is what that means. Um, yeah, so Tarlonio, I agree. Pulling swords from stones, thumbs up if you can do it, right? Uh, 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 taking spears from tables, much less okay. <laughs> yes, Mike, his, his stroke really brought the house down. That is, that is perfectly true. Um, so, all right. So let's kind of unpack this a little bit. Um, what did Balin do wrong, right? Wh wherein did Sir Balin air here? Because this is an important thing, though like so many other things that we've been seeing in this section, it will be important later uh, uh, l rather than sooner. But still, this is, an, this, is a, uh, this is a good little illustration in how to interpret your surroundings. Right, a little test which Sir Balin completely fails. Um, so let's let's look at this carefully again. Uh, he's gone into this room, the room, the one that's uh, marvelously diked and rich. Okay, so it's the, the 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 thing that's emphasized about the room is the the richness of it. It's not just that it is a nice room, right? It's an incredible uh, you know the cloth of gold and everything. And it's it's like beyond a royal chamber, right? Um, and the bed is a particular... To the centerpiece of the room is the bed. And the bed has this gorgeous cloth of gold, the richest that might be. And there's somebody lying in the bed. Okay, now, we, that's, all we, that's all he sees, that's all we're told, is there's somebody lying in this rich bed. And there's a table nearby, uh, and there are four pillars of silver that bear up the table. So there's this really special display table um, upon which is standing a marvelous spear strangely wrought. Very rich room, fancy display table with fancy spear and body lying in the bed. Now, you're being chased by a homicidal king with possibly a battle axe, right? Uh, certainly some grim weapon with which he is seeking your life because you just killed his brother. Um, you're looking through the castle for a weapon, and you find one, right? Here it is, a weapon that you can use. Um, <laughs> Jeffrey says it helps that his Scalibur had instructions written directly on it. Uh, yeah, yeah, it really does. Um, Sarah is asking, was it really a table or an altar? that the spear was on. Yeah, it is a little altar like, yeah, it, it kind of is. Um, and, uh, yeah. Um, so Xenia, it, Xenia, it does seem likely that that spear is a relic, right? I mean, in retrospect, see, it's a little hard for me. I, I'm a I'm a total Sir Balin apologist here, you know. I I uh it's not that Sir Balin does nothing wrong. He doesn't do nothing wrong. He errs, right? He is a very I think this is why I relate to Sir Balin so much. You know, he's like seems to be a generally well intentioned sort of underdog knight trying to prove himself, trying to do the right thing. We see him very actively trying to do the right thing on many, many occasions, right? Um but just this he gets keeps getting put in these situations. So, I mean, it's one thing. Um, uh, it's one thing for us to be like, well, dude, didn't you notice that this, you know, is not, you, dis you probably shouldn't have used that weapon, right? But, you know, it's, it's for me to say I'm not being chased by a homicidal dude with a battle axe, right? Uh, uh, but, um, but nevertheless, you're exactly right. The failure, where Sir Balin failed, is in the interpretation of his surroundings, right? There are some clear cues here, which he should have gotten. And if he were more, Carita, I like that phrase, if he were more spiritually attuned, right, um, 
he would probably have picked up on this, right? Uh, he would have even in a hurry, uh, looking for a weapon to defend your life desperately, you still might have noticed, right, that this was pro. This was you might want to keep running into the next room after uh, and see if there's perhaps an even better weapon than this. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yes, and see, several of you have exactly the right impulse as to what it is. Um, this is indeed a very special spear. And we're gonna, needless to say, don't worry, because we're gonna we still have Merlin. Um, we're not gonna have Merlin forever. He's going away fairly soon. Uh, but as long as we have him, um, we he, we will have him to be able to explain everything to us. So, um, um, uh, so that's 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 all fine. Um, yeah, Matt says, Balan's problem is never what he does, it's where he does it. Yeah, I mean, even but decapitating the Lady of the Lake, right? Um, it, was, it was the timing there. It's not the decapitation so much as the timing. And here again, not the attacking of, Sir Pelham, of King Pelham so much as the... Um, uh, 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 the circumstances, right? <clears throat> I have to admit... Though, again, another thing that really kind of makes me side with Sir Balin here to some extent is King Pelham is going to be called the greatest guy. Like, this is the greatest, like, holiest guy in the world. Like, he's, he's this huge, we're told, we never see it, but we're told he has this huge reputation and is awesome, right? Um, and one of the, like, uh, yeah, again, like, greatest, kingliest, holiest guys in the world, right? Um, whose brother is one of the most despicable knights that, I mean, Sir Garlan, right, is terrible. Sir Garlan is just about, there's only one guy worse than Sir Garlan, right? Uh, okay. King Royans, the guy who collects the king's beards, that was, he wasn't good. Um, but there's, a, Sir Garland is near the bottom of the heap, right? I mean, he he certainly makes the bottom five list of most despicable knights uh, in all of Mallory, and King Pelham is his brother and defending him, right? Um, so it's it's hard for me to feel like King Pelham is the one in the right here, um, and uh, and that Balin is the one in the wrong, even though, you know, this, um, um, uh, even though. <laughs> Sorry, I just saw Sarah Grant's comment. Uh, uh, just a good old knight, never mean and no harm. And I am inevitably trying to think now of an entire, uh, an entire Dukes of Hazard uh, theme song uh, uh, spinoff for Sir Balin. It actually really seems to fit in a lot of ways. Um, uh, <laughs> Except it's not the law that he's in trouble with, right? It's like fate that he's in trouble with. Um, but um, anyway, so um, uh, yeah. Well, let's get to Merlin's explanation. And King Pelham lie so many years sore wounded and make never be whole till that Galad the Haucht Prince healed him in the quest of the Sangreal, for in that place was part of the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which Joseph of Arimathea brought into this land, and there himself lie in that rich bed. The dude in the bed was Joseph of Arimathea himself. That was the corpse of Joseph of Arimathea lying in the bed with a cloth of gold on it. Oh dear. And that was the spear which Longius smote our Lord with to the hurt. And King Pelham was nigh of Joseph his kin. And that was the most worshipfulest man on live in the dies. And great pity it was of his hurt, for through that stroke it turned to great dull try and teen. Than departed Balin from Merlion, for, he sighed, Never in this world we part, neither meet no more. And he rode forth through fire contrays and cities, and found the people dead slain on every side. And all that ever were on live cried and sighed, Ah, Balin, 
thou hast done and caused great vengeance in this countries. For the dolorous stroke thou gaff unto King Pelham, these three countries are destroyed, and do it not, but the vengeance will fall on thee at the last. Oh, man. Okay, so uh, one thing that we see here is that... Um, uh, one thing that we see here is that everybody knows, right? Uh, word travels really fast uh, in King Arthur's realm. That's certainly something that, that we will see a lot. Um, yeah, so Dole, Trey, and Teen, um, that's like sorrow, sadness, and sadness. It's their three essentially, essentially synonyms um, uh, uh, for like pain, sorrow, and suffering, essentially. Um, so, uh, yeah, um, so Mer this is Merlin's explanation, right? Uh, telling, uh, Balin about what happened. So that was Joseph Arimathea in the bed. That was the spear, Longinus' spear, uh, the spear that was used to stab Jesus in the side when he was on the cross, and then blood and water comes from his side, uh, showing that he is dead. Um, and so some of the blood, Jesus' blood, was also there, because Joseph of Arimathea, Holy Grail, right? He, he has the Sancreel, the Holy Grail, uh, with Jesus' blood in it, and he brought it to England. Everybody knows this, right? Um so King Pelham is actually closely related to Joseph of Arimathea. Um, that's why he's got Joseph of Arimathea's corpse in a bed in his house, right? Um, so now Ben asks a very sensible question. Why is everybody dead? He says, I don't get the chain of causation here. Me neither. I would love to see a coroner's report on these corpses that are just strewn about the countryside, right? Um, uh, we don't know what they died of exactly. But what we do know is that it was all Balin's fault, right? Because of that dolorous stroke, um, uh, people are dead slain on every side. Right? He just goes, there are just corpses all over the country. Three countries have been destroyed. So not only is the, is the, does the, is the, you know, not only did he bring down the house, um, uh, he was slaying them in droves, right? This all happened. They all had strokes. <laughs> uh, yeah, 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 Zach, that's what we'll say. Um, um, yeah, so I don't know. I don't know the mechanism, right? All we know is that this was a very bad thing that happened, right? Um, it's like a curse, essentially, right? I, I, Notice, though, here on the side. Remember we were, we've been talking about the fairy elements, right, in Maori? This is very like one of those fairy elements. Um, all of the paraphernalia here is Christian, Right? Um, it's all, uh, you know, the blood of Christ, spear that stabbed Christ, Joseph of Arimathea, uh, the, the dolorous stroke is itself this kind of recapitulation, right? He's been stabbed with the spear that stabbed Jesus, uh, putting King Pelham, rendering King Pelham into this uh, uh, sort of uh, parallel with Christ. Right now he's, except it's like instead of dying to save everybody, he's been wounded and that kills everybody. So it's, it's, it's sort of parallel but anti-parallel and kind of weird but anyway again all this stuff is christian stuff and yet it doesn't work like christian stuff this doesn't feel like miracle this feels like a fairy curse not like miracle see miracles are not nonsensical there's there's i mean they might be unexpected right and they're sometimes strange but there's no question about the causality Right? You might not understand the mechanism, but you know the causality. God did it. Right? God made it happen. And usually you know why God made it happen. Right? Again, they can I'm not saying miracles can take you by surprise, but they're not weird and mysterious usually like this. Right? And the cause, cause and effect is normally fairly clear. Like, 
you know, you did something bad and God sends the flood, right? I mean, the, 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 and God often explains, usually explains, often in advance, right? The, the, the causation, right? Because you guys did this, this is going to happen. Um, or it's a good causation, right? Like, because you're starving in the wilderness, I'm going to send you bread to eat, right? The, you know, so... Uh, shaky causality, weird stuff just happening for no apparent reason and without any obvious mechanism is actually not. That's not Christian. That's not a miracle thing. That's a fairy thing. I always, again, it, it sort of, it feels like a fairy thing um, rather than uh, really, it doesn't, it doesn't feel, um, well, see, but I don't even, a couple of you are saying it, it sort of seems more Old Testament or like the Ark of the Covenant. Yeah. But see, again, the causality is clear there, right? I mean, like when the Ark of the Covenant is kind of wandering, when the, well, like when the Philistines are passing the Ark of the Covenant like a hot potato around the kingdom because bad stuff keeps happening everywhere where the Ark of the Covenant is. I love that story, by the way. It's one of my favorite uh, stories in the, of the Old Testament. Um, uh, Hooray, we captured the Ark of the Covenant. No, you keep it. I don't want that thing. Um, uh, it's great. But again, it's not, it's not, I, they don't, again, they don't understand it. The Philistines don't understand it, but we understand it, right? I mean, the story uh, makes, the point of the story is not mystery. The point is to make it clear, right? Um, why these things are happening. Uh, again, not exactly how uh, and all that, uh, and all that kind of thing. But, um, uh, but it's, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's 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 not. Um, I stabbed somebody with a spear in defense of my own life, and all of a sudden the house exploded, and everyone around the countryside is dead, and I have no idea why. Is that I can't think of a single example of any kind of story like that anywhere in the Bible. That's just not how things work. There can be. It's not like there are never extreme consequences of particular actions that can happen. Right. But again, you know why uh, and you know how, in a sense, I, you know, again, you might not be able to work out the actual mechanism, but, you know, God did it right. The hand of God has moved against you um, here. Even though we have a sort of explanation, I mean, notice Merlin's explanation is kind of an explanation that doesn't really explain, right? On the one hand, we can get the, what we get is sort of the interpretive key to what Balin missed, right? He gets into this room, which has Joseph of Arimathea lying in the bed and, and the, 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 the spear that pierced the side of Christ on a display table or altar. And, uh, and he misses it, right? He totally does not understand, uh, uh, doesn't even seem to have any clue or suspicion about the significance of this. So had he himself dropped dead, for instance, that would have seemed totally like legit, right? Um, but for him to pick up the spear and everybody else dies and he just wanders off confused as to what happened and why, that's strange. Um, now, a couple of you, let's see, Mike was saying, I think somebody else earlier was pointing out the, um, the miracles that happen at the moment when Jesus died, how like dead people spring up out of the ground. Well, again, it's like that, except in reverse, right? Instead of dead people uh, uh, coming up from the graves when Jesus was killed, uh, was crucified, you've got living people dropping dead, right? Um, yeah. Again, there are some kinds of parallels there, but... It's not very, and I get, my main thing is that none of this even, and I hope you know what I mean by this, none of this even smells Christian. Uh, again, the elements are Christian, but this, this is not, it is not at all like, this does not feel at all like a Bible story. What it does feel like is a fairy story, right? Where you find yourself in the land of fairy and you're told that if you, um, you know, if you break some prohibition which does not make any sense to you, then some terrible thing is going to happen that you don't understand why it's connected to that apparently innocent thing that you did, 
right? This is much a, a much closer parallel to that. Um, and again, I you know if you say well like stabbing a dude with a spear is not exactly like the arbitrary break you know like eating a pomegranate seed or something like that. But it is actually in the context it is. He's defending himself, right? He's a knight. He's being attacked by a knight. He's weaponless. He picks up a weapon and defends himself. Again, he tres he 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 trespassed, right? Um he transgressed, but he um uh he does not experience the consequences of that. Everybody else does, right? Um Yeah. Yeah. And Steve and I agree. Even the tombs giving up their dead has a cause and effect relationship, um, which is. Well, that's not made very explicit, actually, in Matthew, where it's brought up, but it's it's pretty strongly implied. Um, yeah. Oh, good. I see. David Attlee was also thinking about the pomegranate seeds uh, as well. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, Oh, so James is saying when it says that King Pelham lay for uh, so many years. Um, yeah, many years have passed already at the time of the telling. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. This is all this stuff is all ancient history. Um, uh, everything that happens in these stories is ancient history. Um, so we know that King Pelham will lie wounded for many years after he's wounded by Sir Balin. Uh, and we know it's going to happen. More spoilers, right? Galhead is going to come through and is going to heal him uh, in the quest for the for the Sancreal. Um one of the things that we, um, one of the things that we are getting here, uh, is a little taste of the quest for the Holy Grail, right? Um, this is, of course, we've, we've been getting a lot of heavy, uh, hinting, right, about the quest for the Holy Grail, uh, including like, remember that lady who needs the blood of a lady, of a, of a, of a, of a girl, right, in order to cure her. Um, and so the dam, you know, Balin's damsel bleeds for them and, uh, uh, you know, does no good. And then we're told it's going to be Percival's sister, right. Who's going to be the one who's going to heal that lady. Um, in during the quest for the, for the Holy Grail, there's lots of, lots and lots of references to the quest for the Holy Grail and the stuff that's going to happen. When we get there, we will see your primary job as a Grail knight is to be accurately interpreting the landscape. Right. When you are in the quest for the Holy Grail, you are living an allegory and it's your job to make sure that you're properly understanding that allegory. Right. Um, if you don't, you can mess it up. Sometimes you can do the right thing by accident or because you're the right kind of guy um, who just tends to do the right thing, even if you don't know what you're doing. Sorry, that's my little summary of the career of Sir Percival, actually, uh, who is another delightful and charming knight. But um, uh, Balin fails, right? Um, he blunders around, uh, finds himself in this, you know, mystical and sort of uh, uh, this sort of mystical tableau and just um, treats it like an armory. Right. And that's not good. Um yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, what we'll, we'll, we'll get much more of this, much more of this. This is again, this that the, 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 the tale of Sir Balin is in many ways a setup, in some, of course, in some uh, cause and effect ways, like the setting up of the, I mean, this guy, this is the Fisher King. Right. Uh, this is the Fisher King who's going to be healed uh, by Galahad uh, during the quest for the Holy Grail. How did the Fisher King get injured uh, and why does his land need healing? Um, you know, why is not only he uh, need healing, but his land needs healing because of the dolorous stroke of Sir Balin. So this is where this is where all that happens. Um, <laughs> dolorous says, uh, uh, stroke says, I think the spear should have had a label. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, Yana, um, when did the contemporaries assume that this took place? Oh, like fourth century. Yeah. Fourth or fifth century. This is ancient. Um, uh, this, oh, oh, the King Arthur, everybody knows King Arthur lived in like the early fifth century is where they, all this stuff is dated early fifth century. Yeah. 
So this is ancient, ancient history. Maori's writing stuff that he considers more than a thousand years old. Yeah, everybody knows that. Um, it's easy to mistake this because of the very stable medieval tradition of telling stories from within their own context, right? The, 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 well, not just the knack of the desire to, um, tell a story within its proper historical context, right? Like period dramas were not big in the middle ages, right? Um, so if you're telling a story about Greece and Rome, you have the Greek and Roman uh, warriors dressed up in plate mail and jousting. Like, that's what you do, right? Um, they didn't have any attempt. It, that was just, it was just a totally alien storytelling thing that you would try to get, you know, uh, sort of realistic and accurate to the period, right? Um, so if all of these people sound, if this sounds like a complete, like a contemporaneous high medieval 14th or 15th century story, yeah, of course it would. But yeah, no, this is all happening a thousand years ago. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, Michelle asks, did they not know how things really were or did they just not care? They just didn't care, Michelle. So, I mean, like, they just didn't care. Like, they read the Aeneid, right? I mean, so, like, they read the Aeneid. They knew how they fight. They knew the Aeneid really well. Like, almost every, well, you know, almost every educated boy translated the Aeneid, right? They know the Aeneid really well. And yet, when they retell the Aeneid, they go out of their way to put Aeneas in armor and have him joust with Turnus, right? Because that's what would happen. That's what's what that's because that's the story that you want to tell. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and Bruce, exactly. You can see this in their visual art as well. When you look at the uh, a lot of uh, medieval illustrations of Bible stories, absolutely, you will see the biblical characters dressed in in medieval clothes. Um, absolutely, um, that is that is totally um, that is totally normal. Now, Veronica, you're right. There is. Uh, If you think about fifth century England, you know, there are some really interesting kind of cultural and religious tensions there. Right. But uh, that's not um, that's not what uh, uh, Mallory is not sort of treating that again. He would have to be interested in what things were really like in the 5th century and I see absolutely no evidence that he was really interested in uh, what things were like or even what was happening historically um, in, uh, in, in the um, uh, in the uh, in the in the 5th century. A couple of you are saying it's kind of like uh, you know like a modern treatment like Sherlock right doing the Sherlock story uh, in the 21st century. Well, no, it's not like, I mean, it is like that, except, uh, imagine that the, you know, the, the BBC Sherlock series just insisted all the way through that it was the 19th century, right? Um, this was the 19th century, but people were all like driving cars and using cell phones. And I mean, so exactly the same plot, exactly the same setting, everything looking exactly the same. It's just we're supposed to imagine that this was happening in the 19th century. I mean, it is so alien for us to think this way. We are hardwired to be offended by this. We are, you know, uh, on the lookout for any kind of anachronism uh, in any sort of... We'll get offended by anachronism. Certainly, we would consider it merely silly uh, if somebody was... Um, you know, Mike, as you were suggesting, using a cell phone in a World War II film, right? Um, think, think of the outrage if somebody just tried to do that, right? If somebody just had, uh, you know, people on the battlefield, like, you know, uh, uh, commanders on the battlefield, just like pull out an iPhone and call each other, right? I mean, that would, that would, be, that would like completely wreck it for us. Um, in the Middle Ages, they, again, it's not that they didn't know any better. They didn't care. That is not the basis of their art at all. Uh, they knew full well that the Greeks and Romans didn't fight this way. They just didn't care. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, Bruce 
Well, see, but no, it's also not like Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell, right? This is not an alternative history either. They're not suggesting it's an alternative. But this is this is real history. This is real history. Just deal with it, you know? I mean, <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> it's fine. Uh, I don't know. The one thing I would say is if this whole approach seems just wrong, that's because you're bigoted, right? You are coming from a modern perspective. Those assumptions about what makes good art, the idea that lack of anachronism uh, is an obvious like minimum bar for telling a historical tale, right? Uh, you know, that you don't go back and give... Um, you know, William Wallace, a machine gun when you're, t when you're telling that story, right? Like that seems like a pretty obvious, uh, uh, thing to do, right? Um, like a, a very low bar, but that's a modern assumption. That's not a, that's not, a, that's not automatic. Who made that rule? Why should that be a rule? Right. Um, again, even the question of, um, uh, but Bruce did Maori think all this was nonfiction, Yes. Yeah, see, this is... If you want to try to understand the medieval perspective on history and on stories, consider these two things, right? First, they knew full well that this is not exactly what... This is not what it would have looked like. Two they would say, this is the real story. That's it. That's it. And statement number three, they're not stupid. They're not stupider than you, right? Don't make the mistake of thinking that medievals are dumb and or naive. Uh, they, sometimes they can be naive, of course. So can modern people, desperately naive, right? Um, so, but that's, it's, I don't find that any more a characteristic, a typical characteristic of medievals than of moderns. Um, they understood these things. They weren't bothered. We're bothered. We insist on certain things. They didn't. They insist on different things. Our job as modern readers is to try to free ourselves from our own blinders, our own assumptions about how historical tales should be told about what the concept of historical accuracy means. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's tricky. It's fun. Um, they are presenting it as history, Yana. Absolutely. Are, uh, so are they claiming to tell history in a way their audience will recognize it? Well, Yeah. They're doing that, sure. Um, and in doing that, they're telling the true story. The true story, mind. It doesn't mean that if you were there, it would have looked just like that. What good does that do anybody, by the way? Right? If you've ever read any history, it's boring. <laughs> modern history, horribly boring. Medieval history is so much less boring than modern history. My goodness, modern historians can be dull and pedantic, right? Medieval historians did not have that problem. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's, you know, it's all in your approach. Um, yeah, Bruce says this is part of why C.S. Lewis insists we should read old books. It is very broadening, very broadening. Totally agree with C.S. Lewis about old books. It is very broadening. There are so many things that modern people don't even assume they're assuming, right? Or just assume is a, is a law about how thought works, right? Uh, until you read stuff written by people who, smart people, people whom hopefully, you know, if you have uh, any kind of sort of sensibility at all, you gain a respect for, right? Uh, you know, you read the work of medieval authors, you have to respect their brains. They know what they're talking about. They're not stupid, right? And yet they say things which only a very stupid modern writer would do. Um, yeah, 
Yeah, exactly. Druid's Fire says historical accuracy. You'll keep using that word. I do not think it means what you think it means. Yeah, exactly. That's kind of the message to modern people. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, See, did anybody doubt the historicity of this at the time? Uh, sure, uh, to some extent. Uh, okay, it's hard to say in some ways because the stories all agree that this is the history, right? But that doesn't mean that that's actually what your average person on the street believed. Probably they did. Um, I think, you know, Jana's talking about uh, Caxton's, uh, 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 you know, sort of defensive tone um, in his preface about the historicity of these stories. Um, I'm, I think you might be mistaking Jana a defensiveness about the historicity of the general account versus the hist the authority of this account. Remember, one of the things that's happening here, um, you will have noticed uh, that this book is written in English, right? It's a big deal. Even in England, that's a big deal still, right? Um, what Mallory is doing is giving the first ever comprehensive English version of the matter of Britain, right? Um, this is the first and greatest real attempt to naturalize King Arthur, who has always been associated with Britain, um, even though most of the stories that have celebrated him have been French, to this point, um, and, the, and many German uh, uh, and others as well, but um, not English generally. Uh, there have been a couple English uh, stories written. There are many middle, uh, you know, uh, middle English poems about the adventures of Sir Gawain, for instance, and uh, and uh, and other Arthur stories, like for instance, of you know, a, a very famous uh, Death of Arthur uh, poem. Two famous Death of Arthur poems in English, but. There's not been any, no one's ever done this, what Maori is doing, taking the whole, all the stories, even conflicting versions of them, right? And bringing them together into one great definitive English collection. Um, so, Yana, I think primarily what Caxton is defensive about is, uh, no, this is the authentic, for, you know, this is, this is, this is the real deal, right? Uh, don't read the French stuff. This is it. Um and, uh, yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, exactly. Ma uh, Matthew says, thinking about the historical question, um, what do you want to be accurate about? The feel of the events, which requires a sympathy with the reader, or the details of the event? Uh, um, yeah, exactly. Exactly, Matt. Modern historians go the latter route all the time, right? Uh, medieval historians go the first route almost all the time. When they tell you the story of the Battle of Agincourt, they, if you feel like, if you read that and feel like a, a, one of the Englishmen on the field after you have routed the French, then the historian has succeeded, right? They have conveyed to you the real story of Agincourt. It doesn't matter if the details are different, Right. They have conveyed to you the real story. That's also why they change the historical stuff and don't care. Right. They're wanting to tell you the story. So when they're redoing, when they're telling a medieval version of like the Iliad stuff. Right. And they're having, you know, Paris and Menelaus jousting each other and stuff. They're trying to convey. Right. What you know, what is the essence of this story? They're translating it. They know they're translating it. Right. But they're translating it for a purpose uh, because they're trying to convey um, the essential, the essential thing. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, uh, 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 Dolly, I agree. It is, it is, it is like the theory of translation. How do you, how do you translate? Absolutely, uh, translating culture is very much uh, sort of what it's like. Again, translating the time, the history. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Jeffrey says, would a historian be more like a bard and a chronicler more like a historian? Uh, well, no, no, there's not really. I mean, I'm not saying there's no distinction, but even chroniclers do the same thing. I mean, you know, I, I, I get kind of I always get kind of twitchy when modern people say medieval historical chron chron chronicles are really untrustworthy. That's offensive. Right. I, I, you know, uh, 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 medieval chroniclers would be offended by that, by your standards, maybe, if what you're interested in are the, the facts and the details. If you really want to know how many combatants were on the field at the Battle of Agincourt, then sure, you know, uh, uh, the, uh, F Fossar might be, might be inaccurate. But if you want to know what the Battle of Agincourt was like and what it means, he is much more accurate than the modern account, which just tells you exactly how many people were there. What does that tell you? Right. Nothing is what it tells you. <laughs> uh, anyway, it, it, it's because that's, you know, what does it convey? What are you conveying? Um, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, So uh, Rachel says that the setting of Arthur is more like Beowulf's time than knights and castles. Oh yeah, oh yeah, definitely. Um, uh, earlier than Beowulf's time. Beowulf is modern compared to King Arthur. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, but again, we don't have to worry about that. Um, the actual date of the is only going to come up a couple times, uh, and it's almost never going to be important. Uh, in the, in the story. Um, yeah, Brian, are medieval historians more interested in whether their histories are instructive or leave a specific impression or message with the reader? The, both of those things are good, right? Um, in fact, both of those things are kind of the same thing. Uh, leaving a specific impression or message with the reader that is instructive, right? And that's not to say that they're just trying to moralize everything, though goodness knows that was a hobby uh, in the Middle Ages, too, that you should take uh, the proper moral uh, out of the event. Um, but again, uh, the Battle of Agincourt, again, just since I've already cited that, that was such a massive upset uh, on the part of the English that you can't if you exaggerate the numbers, right, multiply the French troops by 10 and reduce the English troops by a factor of 10. Uh, if you do that, you convey a more accurate sense of what the Battle of Agincourt meant. Right. Um, uh, so in that sense, you're 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 being instructive. Right. You're 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 conveying something. Anyway, whatever. OK, let's uh, um, let's get back here. The winding my way back towards the Dolorous Stroke and King Pelham here. Um, Sir Balin, again, he failed in his interpretation of events, right? But I still, I, I still feel Sir Balin is more of a victim than anything else. Um, it's hard. I, he did wrong, but I still, when I tally up like the number of bad things that Sir Balin did um, and the things that happened, the horrible things that happened, the girl's suicide, which he tried to prevent. And because he did not succeed in preventing it because he didn't want to hurt her, right. By ripping the sword away from her. Um, he's told, well, then because this, so this happened for that reason, right? Cause remember we were talking about causality before that's one of the clearest pieces of causality that were given, right? Merlin says he's going to, he did this. Why did this happen? Why did the Dolores stroke happen? Because he let that girl die. It's like he, back to pomegranate seeds, right? Uh, he, uh, and it's not quite in the sense it's not like a totally arbitrary taboo. I mean, preventing her from killing herself would obviously have been a good thing. Balin certainly would have agreed, right? Um, but, um, uh, but again, he did what he could. And it's not obvious still, nevertheless, uh, why that means he is now destined certainly to. So, if he had stopped the girl from killing herself, 
would this have gone differently? How would that have happened exactly? Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, David uh, Erbach is wondering, would the medieval audience think that Balin was wrong to insist on keeping the sword he drew from the damsel's scabbard? Yes, he was. Um, that was, at the very least, stubborn. Possibly greedy. Um, but that has nothing to do with this. Right? He's not, this isn't what, uh, we're coming to the punishment for that, right? Or the terrible thing he's brought down on himself for keeping the sword, right? Um, but remember there that, um, the, uh, the, remember there that, uh, the sword that the damsel came to the court with was the sword of fratricide, right? Um, so the punishment is he's going to kill his brother with it because it's the sword of fratricide, right? Um, and she did try to tell him not to keep it. Um, although Merlin says she's the falsest lady on life uh, because the other one is dead now. Anyway, let's keep going. <laughs> oh, man. This one is the worst. Poor Sir Balin. Balin just has met this knight, right? This knight who's horribly sad. Horribly sad because he's in love with this lady and he's separated from her and he can't. So Balin is like, hey, I'll help, right? I'll go into this castle and I'll find the lady who, you know, the, the, the damsel who's your who's your beloved, right? And I'll tell her that you're out here. And here's Balin just trying to play matchmaker now, right? This is so friendly and benevolent. So he went in and searched from chamber to chamber, and found her bed, but she was not there. Then Balin looked in a fire little garden, and under a laurel tray he saw her lie upon a quilt of green samite, and a knicht in her armes, fast housing either other, oh dear, and under her head their head is grass and herbes. Oh, housing means hugging, like having your arms around each other. This looks bad. Juan Balin saw her lie so with a foolish knick that ever he saw. Oh man, the guy's ugly too. And she a fair laddie. Then Balin went through all the chambers again and told the knick who he found her as she had slept fast and so broke him in the place where she lie fast sleeping. And Juan Garnish, that is the lovesick dude, beheld her so lying for pure sorrow, his mouth and nose brast out on blading. And with his sword, he smote off both their heads, and then he mad sorrow out of measure, and sighed, O oh, Balin, much sorrow hast thou brought unto me, for thou hast, for hadst thou not showed me that seat, I should have passed me sorrow. Forsooth, said Balin, I did it to this intent, that it should better thy courage, and that ye mix say, and canoe her false head. And to cause you to leave love of such a laddie. God knoweth I did none other, but as I wold ye did to me. Alas, said Garnish, new is my sorrow double that I may not endure. Now I have slain that I most loved in all my life. And therewith suddenly he rofe himself on his own sword unto the hiltis. And once again, poor Sir Balin finds himself standing there, surrounded by corpses, right, of people he didn't even kill. Oh, man. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, Timothy points out that Hals in German is neck, so Hals technically is necking. Uh, yeah, Hals, uh, to grab somebody by the Hals, that's actually a Middle English word. They, they incorporated that straight into Middle English as well. Um, so yes, Halsing, it does mean like, uh, so you have your arms around each other, but yeah, the image there is of them lying next to each other with their arms around each other's necks. Yeah, exactly. Um, Okay, um, <laughs> so Sarah, Sarah Grant says, am I sure we're not supposed to laugh at any of this? Uh, okay, um, no, I'm not 100% sure. But I, I, Sir Balin is so tragical, it is a little bit funny. 
Um, <laughs> Karina does say it's nice to see a man killing himself for love for a change. Equality, y'all. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, uh, and yes, Jeffrey, medieval love is very hazardous. Um, it's uh, it's a high stakes matter. Uh, love people die for love all the time. I mean, even those who don't slay themselves with their or other people's swords. Um, I mean, you can just waste away and die. I mean, remember the the predicament that Uther Pendragon was in at the beginning, right? I mean, he was sick uh, with uh, love for the lady. It, it happens, right? It could have been fatal. This is why Uriens takes it so seriously, right? King Uther's uh, position. Um, but, um, yeah, so, see, now, I, uh, okay. Um, I... No, that's, that's just mean, Mike. Mike is saying that he's kind of like an Inspector Clouseau at being a knight. He is the greatest knight in the world right now, right? Sir Balin is the number one best knight in the world. See, but Tim, I can't agree that he's either a fool or highly obtuse. I, I, what's what's not to believe about what he says right there, right? I I did none other but as I would that ye did to me. If I was in love with a lady and it turns out she was being false, that she was lying in the arms of this uh, other like really ugly dude, right? Uh, he's like, I would want to know, right? I would want to know so that you could leave the love of. So he, 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 this is what he thought was going to happen. Right. He thought that, like, you know, the other guy was going to be like, oh, well, forget that. Right here. I was pining away for love of her. Forget, you know, OK, I'm going to leave the love of her. Right. Obviously, she's uh, she's not worth it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Jennifer says he manages to achieve all of his quests. It's not his fault. Things go terribly wrong afterwards. Yeah, and during, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, and yeah, I'm sure, Karita, that the best knight thing wasn't a cruel joke. He is. He is the best knight. Uh, it's just, he talk about somebody who does not have things laid out for him really well, right? Um, uh, and and here's the other thing. I, I um, um, why is Sir Garnish's bad reaction Balin's fault, right? I mean, like, and Garnish blames him, right? When he was only doing what what Garnish wanted him to do. Uh, I mean, like, is is he his brother's keeper here? You know, come on now. Uh, I seriously. I, 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 I don't know. Um, uh, <laughs> oh, Karina wants to know about the suddenly bleeding thing. Yeah, no, it's just, it's, this is, um, he, so he, he starts bleeding out of his mouth and his nose, uh, spontaneously. Um, so yeah, spontaneous nosebleed due to pure sorrow. Uh, this is just like his, I'm surprised blood didn't come out of his ears too, frankly. Um, uh, he brassed out on bleeding. Like, so Karina, that's never happened to you when you were like really upset. Um, you know, like you get, uh, a, you know, a traumatic event and just like, boom, bl blood pouring out. Right. Um, <laughs> like an anime says Marilyn. Sure. Sure, exactly. Um, uh, yeah, pure emotion. That's it. That's it. That's exactly it. Um, Timothy, Sir Balin absolutely is the Arthurian Oedipus. Um, there's a lot of similarities there. Uh, but, like, I don't know. I mean, at least in... Uh, I, I, I don't know. Oedipus is kind of more of a jerk. The thing about Sir Balin is that he's genuinely trying to... I, I trying to do the right thing most of the time, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> 
two people corrected that. They're like, well, technically, in anime, nosebleeds happen uh, when something is sexy, right? That's a sign of desire uh, rather than uh, uh, of uh, pure sorrow. Uh, yeah, t- so uh, so interesting paper topic, right? Compare and contrast spontaneous nosebleeds in Arthurian literature and anime. There we go. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's great. That's great. Um, yeah, Tarloniel thinks that Garnish really should have mentioned it beforehand. Like, you know, if she's cheating, I don't want to know. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, Balin is... Um, <laughs> he doesn't deserve this. Balin just gets the most horrible career of... Uh, uh, any uh, of any of the Arthurian knights. I don't know. There is no Arthurian knight who gets a worse deal uh, than Sir Balin. Well, let's keep going. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, just in case we weren't sure that, again, one of Balin's short falling, shortfalls is um, um, a little cluelessness, right? The whole Joseph of Arimathea you know, mystical Holy Spear thing went right over his head. Um, that was not him at his most dense, right? Check this out. And within three dies, he come by a cross that is a, a crossroads, right? And thereon were letters of gold written uh, uh, that side. It is not for no knight alone to ride toward this castle. Okay. Then Sauhe, an old whore gentleman, coming toward him that sighed. Balin le Savage, thou passest thy bands to come this way. Therefore torn again, and it will avail thee. And he vanished away anon. And so he heard an horn blow, as it had been the death of a beast. That blast, said Balin, is blown for me, for I am the prize, and yet I am not dead. Anon withal he saw an hundred laddies and many knictes that welcomed him with fire semblant and made him passing good cheer unto his sight and led him unto the castle and there was dancing and minstrelsy and all manner of joy. I'm sure this is going to be well. This is going to turn out fine. So, um, okay. So, um, yeah, horror. Uh, yeah, that means that he's a gray-haired dude. Yeah, absolutely. He's a he's a, he's a he's an old whore gentleman, uh, grizzled and yep yep. Um, <laughs> ask not for whom the horn blasts; the horn blows for thee. Uh, that's exactly it. That's exactly it. Um, Devra thinks that this probably looks like Merlin's handwriting. Uh, possibly, I think not. This cross here, uh, which is presumably, uh, it's uh, yeah. So this this cross here has gold writing on it. And he, um, it is not for no knight alone to ride towards this castle. Remember, double negatives, twice as negative, right? So knights alone riding to this castle, doubly advised against by the double negative in that sentence, right? It is not for no knight alone to ride toward this castle. That's a warning, right? Explicitly a warning. If you are a solitary knight riding toward this castle, you're you know, you're, 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 uh, uh, cruising for trouble, right? Be warned. In case you didn't pick up on that warning, uh, an old whore dude, right? An old gray haired man warns him by name, uh, turn again and you'll be better off for it. And then he vanishes as soon as he says that. And then he hears the horn blow. Now, keep in mind, what is Balin's perspective in all this, right? Um, Balin um, is not unaware, right? He's not unaware when he hears the horn blow. And keep in mind, remember, uh, you're a medieval hunter, right? You have a whole bunch of horn calls, which are quite standard. Right. And one of the horn calls, this is so what he hears is he hears somebody calling the mort. Right. Um, That is the particular horn call that is used uh, to announce that the beast has been killed. Right. So you're 
you're all pursuing a deer, the deer's dead, right? So they blow the mort. So that if you're hunting off somewhere else, like if you've you've wanted, because you don't all stay together in a pack, right? Um, if you've been separated from the rest of the group, you hear somebody blow the mort, you know, A, time to stop hunting, right? Because uh, you missed it, but, uh, uh, you know, the, the deer's been killed. Uh, and also, it's over there. <laughs> That's the other advantage to blowing the mort, uh, is that you can, you can uh, uh, start making your way back to uh, catch up with everybody else. Um, so he hears somebody blow the mort, and he immediately interprets it. That blast is blown for me, for I am the prize, and yet am I not dead. I think that that sentence is the most poignant sentence that Sir Balin ever says. Um, that blast is blown for me. I am the prize. I am the creature who is being hunted here. Right? He is coming to the end of his career. He is coming to the end of his life. He's about to die. He knows he's about to die. He says that. Right? I'm not dead. I've just heard the mort blown, but I'm not dead. Yet. But he knows that it was born for him. He knows that he is the prize. He is the creature being hunted. By whom? Fate, it seems, by his destiny. Right? He, uh, and this is why... So why is he going... You know what? Uh, you know, he finds these three fairly significant and obvious portents very explicitly by name telling him to go away. Right? Um, and he ignores them. He ignores them. Not because he's so clueless he doesn't get it. He does get it. He does get it. He knows he's going to die. Um, but he's fine with that. And yet, am I not dead? I'm not dead yet. Right? Does that, is that a sign of hope? Is that him saying, I, I know they're hunting me. Right? I know that, that you know fate is trying to kill me, but I'm not dead yet, doggone it. I'm not sure whether it's that or whether it's, I'm not dead yet, and yet the mort is being blown. It's time for me to... I mean, is this... Is he... Is he reconciled to it? The first part of the sentence sounds like he's reconciled for it. Uh, Sarah Grant says he's still taking whatever adventure God uh, has ordained for him, I suppose. I uh, Yes, several of you are thinking that same thing. James and Jeffrey. Um, yeah, yeah. He's not going to turn away just because he sees clear portents of his own death, Right? That seems to be the adventure that God has ordained for him. His death. His premature death. Right? Uh, these three portents that he sees, not the most... These are not the only portents of his death, or that death is, uh, you know, untimely death is the adventure uh, that God uh, has for him. Right? Um, yeah, Jeffrey, you're right. He has long accepted this. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. He meets with Balan, he, uh, with Balan, his brother, right? And here's the tragical moment, right? Here's the, uh, like Theseus's black sails, right? And so he took the shield that was uncanoeing and left his own, and so rode unto the island and put him on his horse in a great boat. And when he came on the other side, he met with a damosel, and she sighed, O oh, Knicht Balin, why have ye left your own shield? Alas, ye have put yourself in great danger, for by your shield you should have been knowen. It is great pity of you, as ever was of Knicht, for of thy prowess and hardiness thou hast no fellow living. Me repenteth, said Balin, that ever I come within this country, but I may not torn no again for sham, and whatever adventure shall fall to me, be it life or death, I will talk the adventure that shall come to me. He knows. He knows. Even when he is warned beforehand, right? It's not just that, like, he's... Oh, if only he'd realized that, like, you know, having the wrong shield on this day would have brought about his death. Oh, this all could have been prevented. It could have been prevented now. It's like, oh, shield? Yeah, I, I can still go back for it, right? <laughs> no, he's not going to go back for it, right? Um, it is great pity of you. 
so here she's like writing his epitaph already. Of thy prowess and hardiness thou hast no fellow living. Right? Um, so sad that you're about to die in this horrible way, all because you're carrying the wrong shield. And he does not going to go back for his own shield. Or think, okay, if it's the problem is that I'm not going to be recognized because of my shield, maybe when I come to battle I'm going to like introduce myself and... You know, maybe, I don't know, even take off my helmet or something and be like, hi, just thought I should introduce myself in case I should be unknown and some hideous tragedy happen as a consequence. No, no, he's not going to do that. Um, yeah, he does have a he does have a meeting with death. Uh, he is uh, rendezvousing with death, Veronica. I agree. I agree. Um, yeah. Um David Atley is wondering, is this Balin just being stubborn again? Um, you know, he can't turn around for shame. That is, his pride won't let him change course. That's possible, David, but here's another thing I would say in defense of Sir Balin. And I'm such an apologist for Sir Balin, in case you haven't noticed, but uh, I, I know, shocking, right? Um, you're right, David. I think there's there is a good parallel that you can make between his stubbornness and keeping the sword. Right? He says, "This sword I will keep," and she's like, "Uh, you really don't want to keep that sword because if you do, you're going to kill the person that you love most, and it's going to cause your own death too." And he's like, "I don't care. I'm keeping it anyway." Right? Is that pride? Is that stubbornness? Yeah, it is. He won't back down. Right? He won't do the prudent thing just because he knows that it's prudent. Right? Is he doing the same thing here? Yeah. He is doing the same thing here, but I don't think it's the same. I think that the tone of this, there is a parallel between those two actions. I absolutely agree with that. But I don't think they're just the same. Um, because I don't think he is the same. Um, this knight, the knight who is now approaching the Dread Island here at the end, uh, about to duel to the death with his own brother, um, in which either slew other... Um, which, again, we've known is coming ever since, you know, the fratricidal sword was identified by Merlin, right? Um, this, he's in a different place than he was with the, with the, when he took the sword and became the knight with two swords at the very beginning. Um, he seemed at the beginning to not care what the consequences were. He was going to have his will, right? He took that sword... By that sword, he proved himself, right? He was nobody. He was a prisoner. He was a released prisoner, dressed shabbily, treated like scum by everybody, right? Nobody gave him any, any credit. Um, but he was assured in his own heart that he was as good a knight as anybody else, right? And here he proved himself. He drew the sword from the scabbard that nobody else could draw, right? And so he's not going to let that go. He's not going to back down from that. That sword is a symbol of his worthiness, of his worship, right? Which he's known. He's always been worshipful, but nobody else has ever appreciated it, right? And he's not going to let it go. That's stubborn. That's proud. It's not the same here, right? The tone of it, the actions are similar. I think the parallel is clear, but the message is different, right? This is a Balin who's reconciled. I mean, is this guy going to escape? What should he do? Go back and change his shield? So what? Then he's going to have a happy ending? Really? You're going to try to convince Sir Balin that everything's going to work out for him? If he just goes back and changes his shield, why should that work? Right. Everything this has, that has happened to this dude has turned out horribly, no matter what his intentions are, no matter how hard he tries to do the right thing. Right. So what does he do? He says, whatever. It's all good. Um, Tomas, I cannot help but think of Turin. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, Michelle says it seems more like he knows he's messed up, so he's just going to own it and face the consequences. Yeah, I, I he, I don't think that he's merely self-destructive. I don't think this is an elaborate form of suicide by Balin. Um, but there, I think that there is like, he's a been a walking disaster, right? Everything he's turned his hand to has been disastrous. Um, I think he is kind of, you know, taking the medicine here. Um, 
calm resolve, Jeffrey. I think that is a good description here, just like his his statement about the 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 horn call that he hears. Right. Um, again, from 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 arrogance and and disregard to that calm resolve and acceptance of his own death. Right. This is the adventure that God has ordained for me. Right. This is how things are going to go. I'm not. Why should I try to fight it? Right. Um, it didn't work for anybody. I mean, like ask Oedipus. Is that is, how does that turn out? Right. Uh, trying to fight the adventure that is ordained for you. Right. Um, just, um, better, better really to face it like Balin does here. And he fights his brother and the two of them are like knee deep in their own blood on the island and, uh, they wound each other hideously and then discover their identities before they both die. Uh, and then they both die Balin or Balan very soon. Balin after, uh, afterwards. And uh, no, but nobody knows who he was, his name. But fortunately, Merlin pops up the next day. In the morn, come Merlin and let write Balin's nam on the tomb with letters of gold that here lieth Balin le Savage, that was the connect with the twelve serds, and he that smote the dolorous stroke. Also, Merlin, let mock there a bed, that there should never man lie therein, but he went out of his wit. Yet Lancelot de Lac fordid that bed through his noblesse. And, no, and anon, after Balin was dead, Merlin took his sword and took, of the, took off the pommel and set on another pommel. So Merlin bade a canique that stood before him to handle that sword, and he assayed it and meeked not handle it. Then Merlin loch. Why loch ye? said the canique. This is the cows, said Merlion. There shall never man handle this sword but the best knight of the world, and that shall be Sir Launcelot, other Ellis Galahad, his son. And Launcelot, with this sword, shall slay the man in the world that he loveth best. That shall be Sir Gawain. And all of this he let read in the pommel of the sword. All of it. Every single bit of that. Written in the He must have written very small on the pommel of the sword uh, to write all of that on the pommel of the sword. Um, yes, again, Merlin strikes again with his with his, his gold graffiti. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, that's true, Stephen. I suppose it could have been an enormously huge pommel. Um, okay, Deborah's not quite sure why he laughed. Me neither. Um, so, all right. One thing at a time. First, let's look at Balin's epitaph before we consider Merlin's peculiar actions. Because we have another slide of Merlin's peculiar actions after this. Um, Balin's epitaph. Here lieth Balin le Sauvage. By the way, we haven't even talked about that. He's called Balin le Sauvage. Why? What's particularly Savage about him? I wonder. I don't really know. I've never fully understood that name. Um, he doesn't seem more savage than other people. Exactly. Anyway, there's a lot of actually like nicknames of knights that I don't fully get. Like, why on earth is Sir Grifflet called the Son of God? I have no idea. Le Fils de Dieu is what that means. He's called Sir Grifflet, Le Fils de Dieu, which sounds awesome, but I don't know why he's called the Son of God. I don't think he's actually Jesus. Uh, but anyway, I don't even know. Um, uh, Zachary is wondering if he, if, he, if he gets the name Le Savage from the Dolorous Stroke. Possibly. Um... But again, I don't see why that's especially savage, right? I mean, self-defense isn't... It's not like just only savages defend themselves, right? But anyway, um, that was the knight of the two swords and he that smote the dolorous stroke. So he is... I, so the two things that are recalled on his tombstone, right, uh, are first his being the knight with two swords. That is his drawing out of the sword, his, his feet, which publicly de proclaimed him to be you know, the, 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 the best night alive. Um, that's one thing that gets recalled on his tomb. The second thing is the smiting of the dolorous stroke, 
right? Um, he that smote the dolorous stroke. Um, because that's very famous, right? Um, that is a, uh, that is like a, that is like a historical marker, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm the best and I'm the worst, right? Yeah. That is kind of like a, a little synopsis of the epitaph that Merlin uh, gives him there. Um, Mike is wondering if he's savage because he killed ladies. Well, no, no. I mean, as we're going to see before long, like as it might possibly be next week, Balin, yes, Balin decapitated a lady. Like, yeah, I mean, that happened. Um, but she was, um, she was very bad. <laughs> she was a very false lady, right? Uh, she totally deserved it, according to Balin. Right. Um, we're going to see. Um, uh, we're going to see a, 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 a knight killing a lady in much more savage circumstances um, than Sir Balin. Uh, anyway. Um, OK. Um, Veronica is, is is saying that the French word here might be going back to wild in connection to uh, uh, like Sylvaticus, like of the woods, of the forest. Um, so that it's not necessarily about his character trait, but about his background. Um, right, like he is the dude from the forest. Keep in mind, that's what, that's what a lot of people like. Remember a lot of the knights identify themselves that way, right? Like I'm this dude of the Island. I'm this dude of the forest. I'm this dude of the mountain, right? Or of this particular mountain. Um, I mean, a lot of times it's just like their home address that they're giving. Um, so it is possible, Veronica, that he is, it's just talking about that he is, um, like uh, who was suggesting this earlier before, uh, David Attlee. Um, you know, he's like Balin the Barbarian, right? Um, that he's from the woods, right? That he's from uh, the wild countries. He came out of nowhere, right? He's not, um, is he of noble birth, right? Is he, I mean, yeah, he's noble. Um, he's not a, he's not a peasant or something like that, but he, uh, um, you know, he's certainly a, you know, in Arthur's court, he's kind of a hick, right? I mean, maybe it doesn't refer to anything more than that. Um, yeah. Uh, so, anyway, enough about the epitaph. Let's get back to Merlin. So what does Merlin do? Merlin starts setting things up. So he takes Balin's sword. This is the sword. This is the sword of fratricide, Right? The fratricidal sword, the brother killing sword, um, he takes the brother killing sword, which was also the sign. So it's associated now with two things. It's associated with brother killing and it's associated with distinguishing the greatest knight in the world. Right. And so he's going to take this sword and he's going to set up this sword as a sign. Right. Um, and he's going to fix it so that nobody can. Because it. it before its magic was about the scabbard, right? It couldn't be drawn out of the scabbard um, uh, until, uh, um, you know, the greatest knight in the world drew it out. But now that it's out, anybody can handle it, right? So Merlin's going to upgrade it. He, he puts this trick pommel, this magic pommel on it uh, so that nobody can handle the sword except uh, the best knight of the world. And then, of course, he goes to explain everything about what's going to happen with it. Right. Um, uh, yeah. Um, Brian says, is no one going around behind Merlin to write down all his prophecies and make sure the relevant parties remember them? No need, Brian. He's writing them down himself. Right. First of all, don't forget he's going to Blois, his uh, his master and having his master write down all these things. And secondly, he's leaving graffiti everywhere, including on the pommel of the sword. Right. Um, so he's got that all. He's got that all written out. Um, Merlin is anticipating the great events that are going to come later, 
right? He is looking towards, notice how we as readers are being prompted to look towards Lancelot and Galahad so persistently throughout this whole thing, right? Uh, we already know who's going to achieve the quest of the Holy Grail, right? Galahad is going to achieve the quest for the Holy Grail. We know this already, right? Um, uh, we've already been told this. Um, Lancelot is going to be the greatest knight, the best knight of the world. Um, and it's going to be this sword that Lancelot uses to slay the man in the world that he best loves. And that's Sir Gawain. So Lancelot is going to kill Gawain with this sword. So the, um, um, the, the fratricidal sword, right, is going to, it gets a little metaphorical at this point, right? He's not literally his brother. He does have a brother. Lancelot literally has a brother, but he's not going to kill his literal brother with it uh, or any of his cousins. He's going to kill the man that he loves best in the world, right? Uh, so his sort of metaphorical brother, uh, Sir Gawain. Um, yeah, Mike, I don't know the mechanics of this with the pommel, right? I, I, I know the pommel isn't the grip, it's the weight at the end. I, I know, I don't know why, how that prevents anybody from being able to handle it. And Mike, I saw you're joking about it, like radically imbalancing the sword in the wrong hand, I guess, right? How would that prevent anybody even from handling it? Um, it would prevent them from being able to wield it smoothly, right? But it wouldn't necessarily prevent them from handling it. Um, uh, why does Merlin laugh? It's funny because there shall never man handle this sword, but the best knight of the world. Is he like Van Helsing laughing at the grim irony of it all? Probably not. Um, is he just... I always got the impression... Yeah, Marilyn says he's laughing. He says, ha, I did that right. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I think. Um, he... Uh, um, he's laughing because he set out to do a thing and it worked, Right. And he laughs when he sees that it works um, because what he explains is why it works. Um, yeah, Kitrana says he's laughing because he set the guy up and the guy fell for it. Yeah, well, yeah. Uh, I mean, he was testing it. Right. And the test worked. Uh, and it seems a little mean spirited to laugh at the guy that you set up that way. But, you know, he's Merlin. He's Merlin. He, you know. Besides, he's not long for this world. Let's leave the guy his amusements. Um, we forgot about the bed. How is he going to commemorate the tomb of Balin and Balin? Um, by uh, setting up a bed, a prophetic bed, in which no one is going to lie on this bed except they're going to go insane. Right? So um, you're going to only is it does it make you crazy um uh like it, it does it is it the bed of insanity that it inflicts insanity upon you or would you have to be insane in order to get into the bed uh tune in later when lancelot de Lac finds the bed of insanity and lies in it because we're told, um, uh, we're told that that's, uh, uh, that that's how it is. Um, yeah, no, Mike, I get the, I get the whole purpose of the pommel. I just don't understand how it would prevent anybody from handling it. I, I just like put whatsoever pommel you like on it. I don't see, uh, how it is going to prevent any, I mean, maybe there's a mechanism here that I don't understand and I get that it's magic and I shouldn't be hung up about the, uh, the, the mechanism. Um, yeah, no, I just don't, uh, I don't, uh, I don't see, uh, how the pommel makes it unhandleable. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, one more. Because Merlin's not done. He's got some more future adventures to ordain here. Then Merlion let mark a bridge of iron and of steel 
onto that island, and it was but half a foot broad. And there shall never man pass that bridge, nother have hardiness to go over it, but if he were a passing good man, without treachery or villainy. Remember, exactly the same words about the dude who's going to draw the sword, right? What Balin did. Also, the scalbard of Balin sweared, Merlion left it on this side the island, that Galad should find it. So he took the scabbard of the sword, the scabbard that Balin drew it out of, right? Um, and so he leaves the scabbard on this side of the island so that Galahad can find it. That's why Merlin's leaving it there, right? Also, Merlion let mock by his subtlety that Balin sweared was put into a marble stone, standing upreaked, as great as a milestone, and hoved always above the water, and did many years, and so by adventure it swam down by the stream unto the city of Camelot, that is in English called Winchester, and that some die, Galahad the Hot Prince, come with the King Arthur, and so Galad brought with him the scalbard and enchieved the sword that was in the marble stone, hoving upon the water. And on Whitsunday he achieved the sword, and as it is rehearsed in the Book of the Sangria. Okay, so you are barely going to even need to read the Book of the Sangria after this, because you've already been told uh, everything about this. Um, okay. Notice this set of marvels. So we've got the sword... Balan sword with the pommel that makes it unhandleable. And he sets the sword in a stone, a marble stone as great as a millstone. And he, more remarkably, more remarkable than putting the stone, the sword in the stone, he sets the stone to floating on the water. It holds always above the water. Sounds like the sword is hoving above the water, which would make sense, right? You put a, you, it's a, not a very deep river, right? So you take a big old ginormous marble block and you put it in the river and there's a, so it, it, it looks very attractive, right? It's, uh, uh, you know, the river and in the middle of the river rises this marble stone with the sword sticking out the top, right? That's really great. Except we know that we're told that the sword is going to float. Uh, that's what swam mean by the means by the way. Um, uh, you can even hear still the King James uses the 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 term in that same sense. Uh, uh, those of you who are careful Old Testament readers in the King James will remember uh, uh, Elisha, the prophet Elisha, uh, and uh, when he makes the iron swim, that is, he makes an iron axe head float to the surface of the water. Um, Mike was remembering that phrase exactly. Um, yeah, so uh, so it's the the marble stone, not the sword. The marble stone floats and and floats down the stream to Camelot. And not only does the store the the sword in the marble stone float down the stream to Camelot, um, but it does so on exactly the correct day. So on Whitsunday, Galahad is going to show up. When Galahad shows up to the court of King Arthur, which is a big, big deal, right? The day that Galahad comes to the court of King Arthur uh, is a, uh, a portentous day. And on that day, the sword is going to show up. Okay? So he's, he, Merlin has set up this whole thing. He's, and he's timed it, right? So now I don't know if the marble is in the water, but like at the right time, it's going to start floating and then it's going to float down the stream. Or is it the miracle that it's floating the whole time, but just staying in place. And then it like unmoors itself and, and, and floats down the, um, floats down the, the, the stream. Um, I don't really know. Um, and the scabbard, Galahad's going to be looking for a scabbard, right? So I better put it here. So that's, you know, who Merlin reminds me of here. Um, Merlin reminds me of Doctor Who in the late Matt Smith years, right? 
like using his time travel to go around and set things up in advance. Um, uh, you know, it, it's, um, this is what he's doing. He knows all these things that are going to happen, right? He has this clear vision of the future events, in particular, the events of the quest for the Sancreal, right? And he is going around and preparing all of these things. Galahad needs to discover a scabbard. Um, it's like Merlin has already read the story. Uh, remember the connection between Merlin and the narrator, right? Merlin is bustling around just like the narrator is bustling around, trying to tell us, trying to set up the story that's going to come later. Merlin is, he's like the stage director, right? He's already read the screenplay. He knows that in act four, somebody's got a, somebody's going to come in and find a scabbard there. So it's his job to make sure there's a scabbard there for him to find when he gets there. Um, Tomas says, does he know what's going to happen or does he make, make things happen by saying them in advance? A wonderful question, Tomas, right? He doesn't just, he doesn't keep his, his information to himself, right? He tells everybody that he writes on the sword, right? Lancelot is going to kill his best friend, Gawain, with this sword. Someday Lancelot's going to be holding this sword and right there on the magic pommel is going to be written in presumably relatively small letters, someday Lancelot, the best knight of the world, is going to have this sword, or else it might be Galahad. But anyway, Lancelot is going to kill the man he loves best in the world with this sword. That is Sir Gawain. Um, that's, um, that's his job, right? That's what Merlin does, is to, to... And yet, like Balin, remember, none of them are going to turn away from this. Arthur hasn't turned away from things. Right, Merlin keeps telling him stuff, and it doesn't change anything. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Zachary says, in case anyone forgets their lines, Merlin writes them, writes them out across the countryside. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Um, so, Tomas, he is Merlin is. Is, is a little bit like Gandalf, you know, going around making adv adventures springing to life, uh, you know, where, where, where he goes. He's a little bit like Gandalf at the beginning of The Hobbit. Um, but, of course, he's a great deal more proactive than that. Um, and he seems to know all of this stuff in advance, and he speaks with perfect confidence about it. Yeah. Merlin, at this stage, especially given that it's almost like no one else is really paying attention to Merlin, right? Anyone who is really paying attention to Merlin would already know everything, right? Um, no one would ever be surprised. By, and yet the people who go through these things are going to be surprised, especially, for instance, Arthur, right? I mean, Mordred is going to show up and be a knight of the round table. And Arthur's just going to be like, who do 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 like, he's just going to carry on. Even though, uh, Merlin has told him explicitly about this stuff. It's hard for me not to see Merlin as this kind of projection of Mallory, the somewhat overburdened narrator, right? Mallory, the writer, at this stage in his story, and we don't know exactly the order in which Mallory wrote these things, but I feel pretty confident that this stuff was written relatively early on. Um, Here's Mallory, the author, with all of this stuff, right, that he's got to keep together. And he's got Merlin bustling around trying to make sure that all the parts fit, right, and that, that, that nothing gets forgotten uh, and that, um, um, and that he, uh, he remembers to, to bring together all the things that he's got to bring together. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Ben says, unlike Gandalf, Merlin does see the end beyond all doubt. Yeah, yeah, that's certainly true. It's certainly true. Um, and Brian, you don't get any sense, I don't get any sense anyway, that Merlin is trying to change the future by making these things known. Um, if you ask the question, what does Merlin accomplish? 
Like, why bother telling anybody? Nobody turns away from their course because Merlin told them what was going to happen, right? Um, Arthur's not going to be guided through the rest of his career by his little handbook of Merlin's sayings, right? Where, like, all the, th you know, the, the, the future trajectory of his career that Merlin told him in no uncertain terms. Um, it's not going to happen. So why does he, why does he do it? Why does Merlin do it? Um, what Merlin's job seems to be is to show that there is a story here, right? That this, there is an overarching, like, God has ordained, an adventure has been ordained, right? Um, and we are being shown the shape of it. Mallory wants us to know, Merlin seems to want us to know what is going to happen, to be prepared for what's coming, to get a sense of what the shape of this whole narrative is. Um, we're supposed to know where we're heading, and that's Merlin's job, to tell us where we're heading in detail, um, and to give us the pleasure of seeing these things come around again. All these things we're going to see. We're going to see Galahad find a, cross the bridge and find a scabbard. Right, this sword is going to show up on Whitson Day, uh, uh, when the quest for the Holy Grail comes in, uh, and just in time to get drawn out of the out of the stone by Galahad. Um, the, Sir Lancelot is going to lie in the bed of insanity. <coughs> All these things are going to happen, and that's really satisfying, right? Jennifer, exactly. He's saying these things so that we will know, um, and so that we can anticipate. Hey, you know. Sir Tristram and Sir Lancelot are going to be the two greatest knights in the world and the greatest lovers, and they're going to meet to fight. But don't worry, when they meet to fight, neither one of them is going to die, right? That's what we were told. That's the up Nobody else cares. Even King Mark, for whom the career of Sir Tristram is really relevant, right? Um, as is his wife that's involved in Sir Tristram, that he's, he's, he's old's husband, King Mark, right? Uh, so he's personally involved with, but even he doesn't care about this whole Sir Tristram and Lancelot thing, right? But we should care. We should pay attention. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Brian says there seems to be something comforting to a medieval audience in seeing things turn out, turn out exactly as they were fated to turn out. Yeah, that's there is going to be pleasure in this when we see uh, when we see these things come to pass. We will know that the time is coming. Right. That's why we have spent so much time in this section, in the section on Sir Balin, um, why we have spent so much time um, anticipating the quest for the Holy Grail. Right. When we get to the quest for the Holy Grail, all this stuff is going to be familiar, and uh, we will know that the time foretold is upon us, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Stephen says, uh, again, it's it's like that Merlin is prophet there. Sometimes prophets give warnings uh, to... In, to, to with a recommendation that you repent, right? Uh, lest the thing warn come, like Jonah does in Nineveh, right? Um, but other times they simply said what would happen so you knew you could trust their message, right? And yeah, Merlin is kind of like that. Um, I agree. Uh, yeah, Matthew says, having Merlin tell someone else so the reader can overhear is better than having him talk to himself. Uh, the aside hasn't been invented yet. Right, exactly. Uh, in a in a more modern work, even think about, um, uh, uh, in Shakespeare, right? A Shakespeare character would turn to the audience and speak aside, right? Iago is going to turn to us and tell us everything he's going to do in Othello, right? Um, uh, so, you know, not too long from only a hundred years later, that's what, uh, uh, that's what a character like this might be doing. But, uh, we don't do that in Mallory, so he's gonna. He needs somebody to tell about it. All right, I was hoping to get off into the uh, into the marriage of Guinevere a little bit. Um, one thing I will warn you is that for quite some time, Guinevere is not going to be a very prominent character. Don't get your hopes up. Um, uh, but uh, uh, anyway, we will get the marriage uh, a little bit, and then the interesting events and quests there. Though first, we have to get to the introduction of Sir Tor. Um, uh, which is a little bit awful, but anyway, okay. Um, let's stop there though. 
we're out of time. Um, so we will uh, do the wedding of Sir of uh, of King Arthur next time. Maybe we'll get into Arthur and Acalon next time, but I'm not 100 percent sure if that's going to happen or not. So no worries, we shall go along. It shall we we shall take the adventure that God has ordained for us. Thanks, everybody. Good night now. See you next week. The Mythgard Academy has been offering in-depth discussions of awesome books and films since 2013, completely free to attend and free to download. If you've enjoyed our discussions and would like to help them continue, please consider donating at signumuniversity.org fund.